I'll be reading from Aubrey and Guy will be looking through the Pixel translation. And if, if you wish, you can occasionally point out some differences in the, in, of significance in the two translations. So this is verse 60. And when Moses said to his page, I will not give up until I reach the meeting of the two seas, though I go on for many years. Then when they reached the meeting, they forgot their fish, and it took its way into the sea, burrowing. How does Pickthorpe translate that? And it took its way into the waters, being free. Being free. So saraba is a word that we may want to come back to. Do you, do you have any initial thoughts about that word? Omar, Omar sure Faru. On the one hand, Pickthorpe says it's <coughs> So you see, Saraba seems to have this idea of, because actually I could I mean, ask you for, 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 from, from the linguistic root, it's uh, the Serb. Yeah, that's, was, uh, that's what I said yesterday. Um, a, a, a flock, flock, a a flock, flock. Of, um, of fish, and that's when you get of the idea of the it's tube. a flock of geese and a shoal of fish. Mm. So Saraba from, from Serb. So yeah, because that's where you get the idea of the tube. Mm. Into the um, and well, I did. I actually got the idea of the tube from a translation that specifically said <laughs> "traveled as if down a tube." Uh, he's saying burrowing. Now, Aubrey would only use the word burrowing, which is like digging down deep and going into the earth. If Sarava also has that connotation, well, it's got that kind of thing. So obviously, it's implying a movement, a bit like a flow uh, of fish moving like that. When they had passed over, he said to his page, "Bring us our breakfast." Indeed, we have encountered weariness from this our journey. He said, What thinkest thou? When we took refuge in the rock, then I forgot the fish, and it was Satan himself that made me forget it, so that I should not remember it. And so it took its way into the sea in a manner marvellous. Said he, This is what we were seeking, and so they returned upon their tracks, retracing them. Then they found one of our servants, unto whom we had given mercy from us, and we had taught him knowledge proceeding from us. That's the end of Arbery's translation of those verses. Do you want to read anything from the Pickthall that you think we need to keep in mind as we go into our discussion? Uh, there's nothing that differs in a way that um, is of specific interest, but um, when you'd like me to start talking about this particular section, um, verse 60 through um, verse 65, mm. then I will, because it's a particularly interesting point. Go ahead. And I'd be happy to, um, Go ahead. because this is one of the, this is a miracle that happens in the midst of the surah the miracle of the fish, the fish that is presumably dead and presumably salted and being carried along as their food on this really long journey that's going to take as long as it takes. So Moses says to his page, God has told me to go to where the two waters meet, the two rivers meet, the two seas meet, as they're very variously translated. And that's what I'll do, and I will march on for as long as it takes. So this fish is their sustenance, um, and it's clearly very dead. Um, and at the point where they're meant to be meeting somebody or something, where the two seas meet, without either of them noticing, the fish, in a remarkable and marvellous way, according to the page, um, heads into the water. So it comes back alive, it moves in a way um, the root of the word, as I understand it, implies moving as a shoal of fish moves. Yes, this is the word saraba. Saraba. And sirb, apparently from our experts in Arabic, sirb is the name of a school of fish, a, f a shoal of fish. Mm. School or shoal. You can say school or shoal. See, in his presence I get all my words mixed up. No, they're both correct. All right, we don't need to cut that out. And that it's interesting that Arbery uses the word burrowing, 
as if digging down deep and going into a tunnel. And I think you mentioned that in one translation you read that the fish was described as as if going into a tunnel. Moving as if, as if through a tube. As if through a tube. So we're talking about a channel. So the fish moves as if going down a channel straight into the meeting point of the two waters. And this meeting point of the two seas is interesting because this is a this is a, a liminal point where you have the mingling of two, of two um, waters and there's an overlapping of two separate entities. When you say liminal point, what do you mean by that? At the edge. Liminal means at the edge. So it's liminal in the sense that they're reaching the end of the land um, where the water and the sea meet, but it's also at that end point of the land is where these two separate bodies of water are meeting. And this idea of the fish and these two separate bodies overlapping reminds me of the so-called vesica piscis. It's actually Latin for fish bladder, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's really a geometrical figure um, consisting of two circles, overlapping circles. So imagine if you draw one circle and then from the circumference of the first circle use that as the center of another circle, draw another circle, and what's formed in the middle, the overlap, is an ellipse. And that ellipse is almond-shaped, hence the name for it, which is mandora. It's also fish-shaped, and the, the uh, symbol for Christ that you often see on the back of cars in, um, in Europe and in the States, I believe, is exactly that ellipse. And the tail that shows is just a continuation of the line of one ellipse on each side. Mm -hmm. And that forms the symbol of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, the mandala was used a lot in um, Christian iconography. Um, and you would find the figure of Jesus, or often the figure of the Blessed Virgin Mary with the baby Jesus, within this mandala. Mm. So this overlap is where, for example, heaven and earth meet, mm. or the microcosm and the macrocosm, not just meet but overlap. And it represents a door in a sense. And using that alchemical sense of um, words or the similarity of sounds triggering ideas, in English as a mandala, although in Italian it means almond, in English, it figures man door, the man, oh. the door through which man comes through. How interesting! And in a sense, how is it spelled though in Italian? Exactly as it sounds, M A N D O R L A. I see. Mandola, right. which just means almond. It's got nothing to do with man or door. Right. Um, but it's just like um, it teaches Burkhardt. Uh, mentioned in one of the readings that you gave. That's right. Um, that it could be argued when he, he gives an example which is in Latin um, something to do with um, it was Eve and Ave Eve and Ave when he's talking about the Ave Maria right. and the Eve and he says well of course in Hebrew Eve isn't an, even called that um, and Ave is not the same you know, so two different languages they're two different languages but he makes the point that when linguistic um, triggers happen, not so much from a point of linguistic connection, but the sound, mm -hmm. he doesn't mention it himself, but there's this phenomenon of the language of the birds. Mm -hmm. And the language of the birds is a mysterious concept, and it means many things. But one of the things it means is that the twittering of the birds can trigger the, the memory of a word in the mystic's mind mm. and that trigger will allow an inspirational understanding of some key point that will lead the seeker closer to truth mm. so it, in a sense if it sounds like it is it's just triggering that thing and the the french um, very enigmatic french um, alchemist of the 20th century fulcanelli who wrote a very interesting book called the mystery of the cathedrals in which he explores the idea that the Gothic cathedrals are uh, books of revelation written in stone. And he uses as an example for the way this 
symbolic language is used and hidden in plain sight with the term argot, which is a French word. And argot means a sort of cant, it means a sort of secret language or slang known to the knowers, but something that can be used where the profane or the people who don't know it wouldn't notice. And a great example uh, per, uh, germane to his whole concept there is the term um, la gothique, the gothic art. So L apostrophe, mm -hmm. A-R-T, la gothique uh -huh. in French. Gothic art in right. French is la gothique. Mm -hmm. So encapsulated within the, word, the term la gothique is argot. Right. So he's saying the, uh, the gothic art, mm -hmm. specifically in the cathedrals, uses all this symbolism that because it is archetypal and in a sense alchemical is by its very nature transformative so you don't even need to recognize it for what it is to be moved by it to be triggered by it mm. and this is what happens with alchemical symbolism um, and iconography and within emblems and emblems combine a symbolic figure or a symbolic scene usually with a few words of text, which may or may not be um, directly descriptive, and then with a title as well. And the combination of words and these images can trigger um, responses or connections subliminally within um, a, an individual, which can lead to illumination. And I know from personal experience, um, early in my explanation of alchemy that this is exactly how it works. Mm. You can come across um, a seemingly obscure 17th century alchemical emblem and it will can reflect back to you something that is so personal mm. um, in one's own story and but so symbolic of it that it triggers an understanding of an experience you might have had on a much higher level. So in a sense you can suddenly see the context all around it that gives it a meaning that you could not have noticed through not seeing the wood for the trees and our sort of daily day mm. sort of going through life, mm. which is extraordinarily um, transformative, um, transmuting, and of course in that sense highly alchemical mm. because that's how alchem alchemy works. But to go back to the Surah al, um, al kaf in this situation, so you've got this sort of, what's, what's triggered in my mind is the idea of the Vescopiscus, the mandorla, which is that also a birth canal. So it's a fish-shaped birth canal um, in the sense of things coming through. So Jesus, in a sense, comes through that birth canal. That is the, that is the virgin womb mm. of, of, of Mariam, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, mm. through which... God can make his word flesh. Mm. So it is this interface where things from completely separate um, contexts or completely separate um, modes overlap. Mm. So it's a bit, it's also a bit like the, um, the um, Eastern symbol of the yin and the yang, that there is something of the other in the other and where they overlap that which is of the other can the two of them can meet and express through so thinking of it like that just triggering this idea of the mandorla the mandor and this idea of the fish moving in its marvelous way but making a beeline as if moving with a shoulder fish as if burrowing with intent as if heading down a tube it is going directly to that intersecting point like a sperm, mm. like a sperm going through the birth canal, um, what will become the birth canal after it has met its destination and inseminated. And if that seems too fanciful or too un mm. it should be noticed that, noted that earlier in the surah, um, the word sperm is actually used when God is reminding us that he created man from clay with a drop of semen, with a drop with with a sperm, so it's not entirely out of keeping. And in a sense, he's already triggered that idea that I'm now alluding to, with the association of sperm. That's been triggered several verses before. Mm. 
So it could be argued that we're reading stuff into the Quran, but the Quran invites us to read stuff into it. It's written in a very concise way. It's short, it's pithy. There's no way that the entire body of knowledge that heaven could vouchsafe with humanity could be contained within this one book. So the Arabic language, it seems to me, as an outsider who speaks barely any Arabic whatsoever, it seems to me that the way Arabic works and with the rhythms and the way it's a, it's a very poetic language, it's almost like a primordial poetic language. And what does poetry do? It triggers associations. So the use of one word can trigger different associations and then the use of that word with other words triggers other associations mm -hmm. which are mind manifesting. It is forming visions in the hearer's um, imagination. So I think it seems, it seems to me that the Quran is ideally constructed to allow for this triggering of a, an illuminated imagination. So this specific um, detail, the specific moment where they arrive at the point where something is meant to happen and they forget it. They sit on the rock, they don't notice what happens to the fish and then they push off again. And it's only when Moses says to the page, well, well that was a long day, um, we're exhausted, break out the fish and let's, um, let's eat because we're exhausted. And the, and the, the, set of the servant, the page, suddenly goes, oh gosh, I don't know how I could have forgotten. Satan must have made me forget mm. because how could I have forgotten? I, I saw a marvel. Mm. A miracle happened. The fish moved in this marvelous way and went da -da -da -da, into the water. Moses said, well, we better go back there. This, this must be the place where the two waters meet, that I was told that there would be this meeting. Mm. So they've gone into a strange, they've gone into a strange mode where they are there seeking and some, precisely the point where a miracle occurs, they're half asleep. They're half asleep. So they don't actually see the miracle and the servant only sees it as if out of the corner of his eye, he sees what it is, but it's secluded. So, uh, and off they go. So it's a very odd mm. moment, mm. the whole thing. Mm. And of course they go back and the fish is no longer there, but something else has emerged, as it were, through the man door, and it's a strange person. Mm. And all we're told about this person is that he is a slave of Allah, which means that he's a righteous person who believes in Allah, who has a direct relationship with Allah, and Allah has vouchsafed special knowledge to this person. But I'm not sure, it doesn't even suggest directly in the Arabic that this person is, is even a human being. But before we get back to that, um, I said back to, that's further ahead, before we start considering um, what precisely this personage traditionally referred to as al khidr actually is. Um, is there, I'd like to know if there's anything that what I've had to say with regard to the fish, what's triggered be in mm. me is what seems to me to be um, an inspirational, imaginative idea of what's going on there, um, or ideas associated um, with this miraculous event. Um, anything that you or our companions might have to say about it, or does it sound like sheer nonsense? Uh, I was wondering if there's a, a relevance uh, of, since we're talking about the fish, so the fish is also an, uh, is an astrological symbol, as in the, in, in the Pisces uh, horoscope. Is there, could there be any connection with this or any relevance to what we're talking about? Um, Yes, the fish is the symbol of Pisces. It's actually two fish, it's one of those dual signs. Yes. And you've got the fish moving in different directions. And of course, the fish being a um, symbol of Jesus, and Jesus, in a sense, exemplifying the age of Pisces. Um, 
which we have now literally just moved out of in the last year. We've literally just moved into the age of Aquarius um, at long last. But in terms of its relevance within the Quran and within this particular surah, that's, that's hard to say. I mean, certainly the, the symbol, as it triggers a, a sense of um, the mandala, and of course that also triggers a sense of Jesus because of, um, in um, the iconography in Christian art, placing Jesus in the mandala, or placing the Virgin Mary, um, sometimes with Jesus in the mandala, uh, also triggers that. Um, and in a certain sense, I'm sure some Christians, if they were prepared to take as close a look at the Surah as we are doing right now, might like to think, well, this is a, you know, Kidra can maybe represent a Christ figure who is clearly a prophet, who is close to God, who knows more than even Moses the prophet does. Mm. But on the other hand, I've read Muslim commentators say, well, we must be careful not to imagine that Kidra actually knows more than Moses because in terms of prophethood, Moses is clearly senior because of Moses' position, etc. And there's sort of hierarchical um, problems there. Um, of course, within alchemy, that doesn't really matter um, in terms of those sort of human hierarchies, except it either triggers an understanding um, that works on higher levels or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then it's, it's not really serving the purpose. So I can't really say if, from the astrological point of view, there is a, um, there is a significance except that Pisces is at the end of the astrological cycle, so it's the last sign of the zodiac. Yes. First sign of the zodiac is, is Aries. And interestingly, um, when we come to um, Dul Karnein at the end, um, there's speculation that he's referred to as the two-horned one, because of Alexander wearing um, a hat with two ram's horns, equating to an Egyptian ram-headed god, um, which would personify the age of Aries, for example. Um, so maybe there's, um, maybe there's something in that, that um, the age of Pisces has come after the age of Aries, because in terms of the um, ecliptic, it's moving through the ecliptic, that takes us into the different astrological ages, but they go backwards through the wheel. They don't follow forward. So um, Pisces is the last in the zodiacal wheel as it unfolds through the year. But um, Aquarius, which comes before it, has actually succeeded it in terms of the, uh, the progression of the ages. Yeah, so there may be something in the fact that Pisces is the is the last of the um, cycle. of the cycle. It's the culmination of the work, and there is something. Maybe there is something here in the Sura which is a sort of culmination or moving into a new era of understanding. Certainly, um, when we get to it, we'll explore those um, what the, what the encounter with Kidder means to Moses. And what we can maybe read into that. Because, because Surat al Kaf is, is known to be uh, one of its uses to be used as a protection at the time of the Dajjal, at the mm. end of times, mm. spiritually speaking, mm. in, in, the, in the tradition. Mm. So, end of cycle, end of times. Mm. Interesting. Well, there we go. Mm. Then there could be something specific in a Pisces um, mm. consideration. Yes. Mm. Also, I mean, uh, Louis Massignon. Yes. is the one who refers to the Surat al-Kaf as the uh, apocalyptic surah of the Quran above all others. He actually refers to it as the apocalyptic surah more than any other. And Massignon spent decades with, with Muslims. He did this liturgy in the Arabic language. Um, and he says that the in Syria... Palestine, Jordan in those days, his 1930s, 40s, 50s. Um, he said that uh, it was a 
traditional belief that our recitation of the Surat al-Kaf on Friday is keeping the wall in place, preventing mm. Gog and Magog from, uh, from coming through. Um, so on the, on the subject of the apocalypse on, and on cycles of time, I think what Kaushani says about the fish is quite important. Uh, he says that the fish, the hut, which means, of course, fish and whale in Arabic, it's not just fish, it can also mean whale. He says this is the same type, the jinns, of fish that swallowed Jonah. I was wondering that myself. Interesting. Really? Yeah. Interesting. It was something that occurred to me to ask you if, um, if it could also be the same word used it in is. applying to Jonah. How interesting. Yes. You carry on. Um, so he says, yes, it was the same uh, type of fish that swallowed Jonah. And Jonah is like, he's called the Dunun, the possessor of Noon, of the letter Noon. And Genon has gone into this, and I'm glad I brought his book Fundamental Symbols because Genon talks about the symbolism of the letter Noon in relation to the uh, actually like both the, the, the whale and the ark of Noah so whereas the ark of Noah that starts a new cycle the ark is shaped like the letter Noon mm. and with things inside like a vessel, like a boat mm -hmm. a half circle uh, similarly, Jonah is like the dot in the middle mm. of the half circle. Mm. Um, and so he's called Dun Noon, the possessor of, of Noon, the letter Noon. Um, he also says that the, the significance of the ark with regard to Noah and the beginning of a new cycle of time is almost identical to the story of the cycle in which we are now because one of the uh, the first manifest manifestation of Vishnu in this cycle is as a fish Matsya Pura is it's the avatara which is a fish and it's said that Vishnu appears as a whale as a big fish to uh, what's his name? Satya Vrata, the person who is holding on to the truth. He's the, the kind of prophet who will bring the law of Manu into this cycle. Um, and he guides this prophet who's in, a, in an ark and he guides him. Vishnu as a fish, as a whale, guides him. So the symbolism is all very, very close. And actually, Genon also says that uh, in the uh, geometric representation of the sounds of the Sanskrit uh, phonetic system. This is pre the Sanskrit letter system that we have now. Mm. The, 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 word, the sound na, noon, is actually depicted as the opposite of the noon. So it's, it's the top half of the circle with a dot in the middle of it. So if you put the two together you have what Genon says is the alchemical symbol of the sun. You have gold and the sun as a circle with a dot in, in the middle of it. Mm. And the full cycle is complete. It's come full cycle. Mm. And, by the way, for those of you who don't know, this is our, <laughs> our, our hidden imam. Abdurrahman Ghazal, who's just <laughs> reminded us that this is talk, talking about the cycle that is completed. The, the cycle of time has come full circle with the joining of the, the Na of the Sanskrit, the Noon of mm. Islam, because he's referring to Hinduism as being the primordial religion and Islam as being the terminal religion. So what we have with this Atlantic, it's actually this geometrical symbolism that Genon is talking about for the, for the letters precedes 
the Sanskrit written tradition, and it's said to be a, a, a heritage from the Ad lost civilization of Atlanta. Mm. So what Abd Rahman is talking about is that that na sound with its rainbow mm. is the inverse reflection of the arc. So the two half circles coming together with a dot in the middle is the alchemical symbol of gold and of the sun, but it's also the primordial and the terminal coming together, the two cycles becoming one, yes. being terminated. And also again, I think, says that this is what exactly what happened in India, that this miraculous meeting of the two. And this is actually something that Dara Shikur talks about, the great prince who was killed by Aurangzeb uh, in the rivalry for the throne, the Mughal Empire. Um, Dara Shikul refers to the meeting of Islam and Hinduism in terms of probably his most famous book, which is called Majma al Bahrain. It's called The Meeting of the Two Seas. Mm. And he's saying it's the Vedas and the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita on the one hand, and the Quran on the other. This is the meeting. So. He could, could be regarded as a commentator on this part of the oh, surah. surah. Yes, indeed. So, it's all very interesting. Well, Omar, you haven't said anything yet. Can we have a comment from you, please? Uh, I have nothing to add. Does this at least sound interesting? It says it's yes, so of course, like, but it does. <laughs> we're not no. flying away on no, some no, fanciful no. trajectories. No, no, it's, it's all very interesting. All right, so I suppose on that note we can conclude this session and uh, I think tomorrow, we're all a bit tired, it's the last day of, of fasting and we're all drooping a little bit, <laughs> so we will resume tomorrow with the second part of the story of Moses and Al-Khidr. <laughs>